Hey, what do you got here? Hey, man, I got this antique corkscrew. I'd like to sell it to you. Are we going to open a bottle or something? <laughs> we can. <laughs> I think this corkscrew is so unique just because of the name and the date on it, and everything still works. I'd like to sell the corkscrew because I'd like to give my wife a really nice anniversary present. Pretty cool. Um, so this right here basically clamps onto the bar like that. Squeeze down on the bottle. And... OK. The handle. Where did you get this? My great grandpa used to have a bar. And I think after Prohibition, all of the stuff he had in his bar got tossed up in the attic. And it came from a hotel in San Francisco. It's got the nameplate and everything on it. OK, that is definitely cool. Does it say the city it was made in? I haven't cleaned it enough to read it, but it has the date 1896. Can't get the city out of it. OK. I don't want to clean it. I don't want to change the value, you know? OK. Well, this is something you would have fixed up and cleaned. It's not like an old right. gun or a coin or something like that, because people want to put this on their bar. Right. Um, can I open a bottle of wine with it? Yeah, you got one? No. I'll be right back. Hey, come back here. Ornate bar tools have been around since bars existed. The nicer the bar, the nicer the tools. Now, stuff like this is really hot with collectors. But you need to make sure it works. So you can operate this thing? Yes, sir. Here, you hold the bottle. It's a two-handed job. <laughs> All right. All right, that was real simple. <laughs> it's easier if it's mounted down. <laughs> Uh, big question is, how much do you want for it? 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many of these bottles of wine did you drink with this thing? I just, out of curiosity, why would you want that bigger? The family that put their name on here mm -hmm. is offering me more than that. Uh, well, then I'd go sell it to the family, because these were very common. If you have a big bar going. But they don't have this name on it. Well, no, they have all, there's a million different names that come on them. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I give you 100 bucks for it. I don't think so. Obviously, we're going to agree to disagree. Make it 500. We got a deal. There is no way on the planet. I'd give you 100 bucks for it. That's only because it's got the San Francisco plaque on it. No, man, I can't take 100. OK, well, thanks for bringing it in. I All appreciate right. it. Thank you. This is a classic example of one of my favorite sayings. Just because something's old doesn't mean it's valuable. This guy obviously needs some quick money, but he's not going to get it from me. What can I help you with? I want to sell my old Taylor Prohibition bottle of whiskey. Pops, I have the medicine you need. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm coming into the pawn shop to try to sell my old Taylor whiskey bottle from the Prohibition era. What's better than 80-year-old whiskey? Where'd you get that from? Well, it was about 30 years ago. A guy owed me some money, and evidently he had two of them, and he found them in his grandmother's attic. He drank one and paid me with this one. Whiskey is what men drink, not these mixed cocktails that these city boys drink. You know why it says medicinal purposes only? I don't know exactly. The Prohibition Act outlawed alcohol, except for when you needed it for medicinal purposes or religious purposes. If you wanted whiskey, you either bought bootleg whiskey or you got your doctor to write your prescription for it. A fixed RX label through opening. So I guess this is where the like prescription label would go. What would happen is you would go to the doctor, there would be some ailment you had, there would be a wink and a nod, and he would prescribe you alcohol, whiskey, and then you know, you go to the pharmacy, you fill your prescription, go home, and you get drunk. Do you know when the mixed drink became popular? No. It was during Prohibition, because the whiskey was just rock gut, the gin was bathtub gin. It just tasted so bad. They had to mix it with something fruity just to get it down. This was bottled whiskey out of Prohibition. That was the most rock gut stuff you ever seen in your life. And it did cause people to go blind. I mean, the box is in pretty good shape for being 85 years old. It's like half the age of him. Yeah. Rick, I'm fixing <laughs> to kick you, <laughs> damn it. I've read about medicinal whiskey. I've never actually seen a bottle. I really want it, and I have no idea what it's worth. So what do you want to do with this? You want to sell it, pawn it? I thought I would just go ahead and sell it. I was hoping to get $250 for it. That's too much. You think so? Yeah. 
Here's the deal. I'm just taking a shot in the dark. I'll give you 200 bucks for it, and that's what I could do. Well, I, I never really knew what I was going to get for it, and uh, that was more than what he owed me by far. So okay. we got a deal. Thanks. Thank you. Now, you can't drink it, Rick. I don't want to drink it. I'm not afraid to take a risk for $200 because it's going to look great in my shop. Can I help you? Uh, yes, I have a uh, very rare piece of Americana. Looks like a book to me. The Bartender's Guide. This is pretty cool. They have fruit juleps right here. What do you yeah, think, Pinky? Do we do fruit juleps? We don't do fruit juleps. I'm coming in to sell my bartender's guide, the first book on bartending written in this country. It was written in 1862. I do not pay much for books. <laughs> I got it at a yard sale in an ox lot. I'm looking to get $25,000 for this book. What's your favorite cocktail? Um, I was straight. asking him. <laughs> I don't drink. Me neither. <laughs> This is really neat. This is basically the book that started it all. This more or less standardized drinks all the way across the country. Your average person in the United States when this book came out did not drink mixed drinks. It really wasn't until Prohibition that mixed drinks really became popular due to the fact that everyone was drinking bathtub gin and really, really bad moonshine. It was just practically undrinkable, so they had to start mixing it with something. Price 150 this is definitely the first edition. It sold so well that on the second printing of the first edition, they raised the price. All the other states will say price 250 on the front of it. How much do you want for it? 25,000. It's got a little wear and tear to it, huh? <laughs> uh, it's got a lot more than wear and tear to it. This is mold inside the book. And mold, when it gets inside a book, will eventually eat holes in it. I'll give you 4000 for the buck. That's what I can do. I was thinking at least $7,000. It's just not there. I'm not going to make any money off it. I'll lose money if I pay that. Tell you what, I'll go 48. I can't go no more debt. OK. All right, we got a deal. I'm sure you didn't pay over a dollar for it. Oh, I'm sure I didn't pay that much for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go write it up. You know what? I should write a book on making cocktails. The Rick Julep. What can I help you with, sir? I have here a 1921 bottle of Dom Perignon unopened. Oh, yeah. Time to party like it's your birthday. Popping bottles in the pawn shop. No, we're not popping that bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to come to the pawn shop today to see if I can sell my unopened bottle of 1921 Dom Perignon champagne. This is a very significant bottle of Dom Perignon. It's the first year that it was made, 1921. Only 1,000 bottles came to the United States, so this is extremely rare. So where did you get it? I got it from my dad, who got it from his uncle. Dom Perignon was a 17th century monk who became a master at anything and everything wine. His big invention was a cork that was held down with a hemp string, sort of like champagne bottles today that are held down with a wire. The reason this invention was so big is when he made sparkling wine, the cork wouldn't pop out. Do you know how to ferment wine? No. Add a little yeast, put it in a barrel, let it ferment. It, you know, the grape juice turns to wine. But when they make champagne, what they do is bottle it before it's fully fermented. That way, carbon dioxide is still forming inside the bottle, so that's how you get the bubbly. Mm -hmm. It was a really neat, weird process, because when they first started making champagne, the bottles weren't really strong enough to hold all the pressure from the champagne. So the bottle makers had to guarantee to buy back any bottles that broke. That's why wine's been around for thousands and thousands of years, and champagne has only been around since the 1700s. 1921 was like one of the best vintages, too. This was like supposedly like the best vintage of this champagne. So how have you been storing this? Uh, it's just been in my great uncle's liquor cabinet, and then when he gave it to my dad, it stayed in there. All right, um, so it's just been sitting straight up like this yes. in a liquor cabinet? Yes. OK. As far as I know, yeah. Champagne has to be stored really cold and down on the cork. I guarantee you, you open this thing up, you will get sick if you drink it. 
I don't want to purchase it because it's not champagne inside anymore. I mean, it, it, it's ruined. Well, I could see that as uh, maybe it's not worth 8,000 as a drinkable champagne. You gotta think about the rarity of it. When you get to down to things that there's only one or two of in existence, drinkable or not drinkable, even a wine collector might like to have this in his collection, even though he's not gonna drink it, just because of the absolute rarity of it. <sighs> You know, I can see your selling point. I mean, I can try and get a hold of someone to come down here and take a look at it. That's all I can tell you. That would be okay. fantastic. Well, let me see if I can get him down here. Okay? okay, terrific. If this guy's right and a 1921 bottle is very rare, it's worth getting someone down here to check this thing out. We'll see if this thing's got any value or if someone should have popped this thing open a long time ago. I'm the proprietor of Marche Bacus, a fine wine store in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been a fine wine collector for about 15, 20 years. Dom Perignon, the most recognizable champagne in the world. 1921, the first Dom Perignon ever produced. Released in 1936, actually, on New Year's Eve. So wine is such a collector's item. Well, being a wine lover myself, seeing a bottle of first introduction Dom Perignon is extremely rare. There's only been 35 vintages of Dom Perignon produced since 1921, and 21 is considered to be an excellent vintage and an excellent wine. So, Rick, what's your concerns? Is it any good anymore? Well, the condition of the bottle, uh, you've got some nicks here on the wax capsules. That's called the eulage level. It's actually fairly low, so you've lost some you've lost some champagne during the process. Typically happens through evaporation. And when the cork dries, it actually contracts in size and allows some of the wine to actually go out of the sides and uh, between the cork and the neck of the bottle. And uh, and you can see that there's quite a bit of sediment in this bottle too. So uh, chances are the wine's probably pretty dead. So I guess the question is, how was it stored during this period? Apparently not the correct way. Uh. I was afraid of that. The way you should have stored it was in 50 to 55 degree temperatures with 75% relative humidity. That would keep the cork moist so that it doesn't shrink it and you don't lose some of the wine. What's it worth? You got a bottle of 21. This stuff is unavailable anywhere. It's a really cool bottle. And uh, in pristine condition, $8,200, $10,000. In this condition, if you put it on the shelf, maybe some guy comes by who wants it just for the value of the label, probably $1,000 maybe. Someone might, might pay as much as that for it. Basically, the wine's worthless a little bit for the bottle. Yeah, exactly. Thanks a lot, though. Hey, you're welcome, man. All right, well, that was some bad news. Well, if you, if you look at it that way, I... I don't see me being able to sell it. See, I think of it as a bottle collector's type of thing. Anyone who wants this is gonna want a, a bottle with good champagne in it. And we have a bottle with turpentine in it. I couldn't use it. I just don't see it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you very much. I disagree with the pond dudes. I think this bottle's very, very valuable, and I think they missed a great opportunity to make some good money. A thousand might be right on the very best of days, but a serious collector is not gonna touch this bottle. So to spend the time tracking someone down who just wants a display piece sounds more like a hassle than a profit. Hi, how are you? Pretty good, how you doing? Good, good. I have a Bridgewater's Corkscrew, produced in 1932 comes in a coffin. This is more or less the, the king daddy of all corkscrews and bottle openers. All right. I guess even back in the day, they were popping bottles. <laughs> 1932 Bridgewater corkscrew was developed by Horace Bridgewater, uh, really to prep the country for the end of prohibition. I'm asking 1,100. On the whole, this is the best Bridgewater corkscrew that I've ever seen and, and probably most people have ever seen. This is pretty cool, man. In the 1920s, prohibition wasn't really thought of as prohibition. It was the Volstead Act. Right. They were trying to get it passed, and no one really thought it was ever going to get passed. And then the bill passes, and now alcohol is illegal in America. Right. It basically created crime in every aspect, because now you got people smuggling alcohol, you got people making alcohol, you got people selling alcohol. And Volstead was the man, the face that everyone could put this bill to. And this is supposed to be Volstead. This guy was hated by everybody. Yes. He was hated by people who drank alcohol because he made it illegal. Exactly. He was hated by the people who didn't drink because now there's so much crime going on. So it seems right that when Prohibition end, they would make a corkscrew, bottle opener, shot glass. Chop them up, put them in a coffin. Yeah. So what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. And how much would you like to get for it? I'd like 1100 Whew. 1100 huh? And again, you know, condition is everything in this kind of a market. It is, but I just don't see it bringing nowhere near that. Where, where, where are you at, then? Man, I'm looking at, like, $150. Can you get up close to 850 
Nah, I, I really couldn't, man. Maybe 300. Um, I tell you what, meet you halfway, call it 550. It's a nice piece. The box right. is in good condition, but I don't see it as a piece I can pay over $300 for. Can't go 350. I could do 325, and we can make a deal. Yeah, all right. Let's go write it up. Very good. About 15 years ago, I bought it for $125, so $200 profit you know, works well for me. What do we have here? Well, <laughs> it's an old mixer, like a drink mixer. OK. It looks like overkill to mix a drink. Well, you know, it just depends on how much you're into drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming down to the pawn shop today to sell my antique drink mixer. The reason I want to sell it today is I really don't have any use for it. I've never tried to use it, but I'm hoping maybe we can mix a drink in the back today when the deal's done. Where did you get it? At a garage sale. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's probably from the 20s. OK. Uh, we'll see a patent on it or a manufacturer. Do you know how the mixed drink came about? No, not really. OK, it was because of prohibition, because the alcohol was so nasty and disgusting that you basically had to mix it with something to get it down. Bathtub gin doesn't taste great. <laughs> <laughs> On January 1st, 1920, it became illegal to sell or manufacture alcohol in the United States. So people started drinking cheap homemade booze known as bathtub gin. The alcohol tasted so nasty, they had to mix it with anything so they could get it down their throat. I imagine this probably was put in a bar to liven things up and make everything a little bit cooler. You always need a gimmick in a bar. You always need to keep it fresh. Otherwise, it just turns into a dive. <laughs> Check, please. <laughs> this is really super power. I mean, you can mix a lot of things in it. I mean, put concrete in it, you can make cement. Um, so you got the other glass? No, and I don't think this is the original glass. I think it broke somewhere. Yeah, there's definitely a market for prohibition era cocktail stuff. But this thing is more of a curiosity than a vintage collectible. And it's a ways from being in mint condition. I like it, but I can't pay a lot for it. All right, what do you want to do with it? Well, I want to sell it. OK. Uh, how much you want for it? 350? Hell no. <laughs> yeah, there's no way you're gonna get 350 out of it. I mean, I might consider it if the thing looks semi-new, but it looks terrible. You know, it's 90 years old, it really works well. You know, things like this have a tendency to sit. It's gonna be a tough sell. I mean, right. who exactly yes. buys one of these things? You know, I'll give you 100 bucks for the thing. 125? 75. He's just mean and grumpy. Yeah, I'll do 125. Okay, I'll take it. All right, thank cool. you. Let's go write it up. Spending my money again. I settled on 125 dollars, and I think it's a little bit more than I was expecting to get. So I'm real happy. I think I'm gonna go out and have a nice meal. So what do we got here? This is a vintage wine and apple cider press. You can actually make un vino increíble para tu casa con esto. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I purchased the vintage wine press at an estate sale. I need to make room in the house. My wife told me it's, it's, it's that or me, so it's going. So what can you tell me about it, man? It's made in Chicago. I couldn't find too much on it, but it's a really cool piece. You probably can't find much on it because one of the secrets to wine is you want to just kind of do it the way they did it a 1,000 years ago. I'm sure the Romans or the Greeks had something very similar to it. You can imagine something like this it was a lot more sanitary, a lot more uh, efficient than actually stomping on them with right. your feet. So you throw your grapes or your fruit in there. This turned. Yeah. Smash the grapes. Go down and down and down until basically everything is crushed down to the bottom, and that's it. So how old is this? From the people that I bought it, they said they had it for over 50 years themselves. Uh, beyond that, I really couldn't tell you. Whether this wine press is brand new or really old, it's still in decent condition, and it makes wine. So really, any collector would want this thing. Any idea what you're looking to get out of it? Well, I was looking to get uh, about uh, 595. 595, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Any particular reason you want that number? Or? It just sounds good, you know? I, I you like know that. What sounds good to me? 350. Uh, how about uh, 500? Um, all right, man, you got a deal. Okay. 500. Thank you. Show them a red show. All right, let's okay, go down thanks. here. You sure you don't want 4.95? Not quite. No. <laughs> the $500, I thought it was fair. I'm happy, and he has his wine press, and I have $500. Hey, how's it hey, going? Good. Good. Got some bottles for you. All right, sweet. But nothing in them. <laughs> I came to see if I could sell my antique bottles. One's a cobalt blue whiskey bottle, and the other is a decanter bottle. I was hoping to get at least a thousand. I hope he's ready to negotiate because I love my bottles and I don't want to give them up for nothing. Oh, we have Casper's whiskey, made by honest North Carolina people. Mm -hmm. It's definitely cool, man. I mean, they came out right after the Civil War. I'm pretty sure they were around for like 20, 30 years. I don't know exactly how long, but I know they were around for a while. And the thing is with Casper's whiskey, they did all mail order. They were literally like the Sears of whiskey. <laughs> okay. And usually they didn't sell it in bottles. Usually it was like in their two and a half gallon or five gallon big, you know, ceramic jugs. So rarely do you ever see the blue bottles. It's usually right. the big jugs. As far as bottle collectors, this is a big deal right here. Okay, so this is um, well over 100 years old. It's hand blown. Now, did you know that the purple glass, why it turns purple? Why is that? Because magnesium was taken out of it in the 1900s. And they put sulfur in it. After that, they don't turn purple no more. Sun's what turns that purple. It's interesting. It's cute. I mean, yeah. This is not the top. Okay, I mean, completely different style. Everything about it is different. So this one I don't want. It's okay. just too tough to sell. How much you want for this one? I'd like to get five. Five hundred? Yeah. I know what I got into it ten years ago. I'd like to give you more, like two fifty. Perfect, not a blemish in the whole thing. This right here is definitely a chip. And that was only because of the mold, and I know it is considered like a chip. That's not part of the mold. Okay. Um, three fifty. I don't even notice the chip myself half the time. If it didn't have that chip, I'd pay you $500 in a second for it. Uh, 275. Split the difference at 325. All right, so 300 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, 300 bucks. Deal. Yeah. All right, thanks, man. I got my money out of it. $300, I'm going to buy me some more bottles. Can I help you? We can cut a pistol and this 16 millimeter movie that was shot in a pretty notorious speakeasy back in the 20s and 30s. The Capone mob hung out there, and in that movie here may be Babyface Nelson and Al Capone's girlfriend. That's really, really cool. My great aunt's basement was a speakeasy, and the video is of a party. The gun was found behind a booth. I would like to get around 3,000 based on that the Capone mob frequented the establishment. So where was the speakeasy at? It was in Chicago. All right. The federal government actually thought about taking over Chicago because basically the entire city was ran by the mob. And the speakeasies immediately happened after Prohibition. Why do they call them speakeasies? Because basically, when you spoke to someone else about it, you spoke softly or spoke easy because it was illegal, you know? They always had code words that would let you in the front of the place. A lot of these places had gambling, ladies of the evening. Sounds like a fun place, huh? Let's go. <laughs> when Prohibition started in 1920, alcohol was being sold all over Chicago by different organized crime gangs. This could be a really cool look into Prohibition-era Chicago. So what's on the VHS? The VHS is actually just a copy of this 16 millimeter movie. OK. I'm really intrigued to see what's on this tape. You're going to need a VHS player, Rick. This is a pawn shop. I think we have one in the back. I'll be right back. I'll be here. I've been telling Rick to get rid of that old TV VHS for years now. But I guess you never know what's going to come in handy at the pawn shop. Look at that. Still works. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Agfa 1938. And obviously, it's silent. Do you know where Babyface Nelson or any of those faces are on this tape? I have no idea what frame they would be on, what part of the movie. 
And I don't know what these people look like. Rick, be kind, rewind. It's been a long time since I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, first off the gun. Well, you have an Otis Smith revolver. They stopped making guns right around 1880, I think-ish. There is a pistol that he makes that is worth a lot of money, but that's basically just a curiosity because it was all brass. This is not that one, and it's in really bad shape. The other problem with your film, Babyface Nelson is not on it. Babyface died in 1934, and right at the beginning of the film, right. it says 1938. Um, it's interesting, but there's tons of stock footage like this already out there. Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm not even going to make you an offer. You really don't have anything marketable here. So you won't offer anything on it? I was hoping there was something on the movie, but there's just not. OK. Um, thanks for coming in, though. Sure. Have a good one. John, give him his tape back and put the TV away. I'm not sure whether the movie was taken or whether it was just developed in 1938. Since we weren't able to make a deal, I'll uh, return it to my safe and uh, give it to my son when the time comes.